Hi all, and welcome to the Medical AI Lab tutorial session. This week, I am delighted that we have an expert guest, Alex Tamkin, talk about domain agnostic self-supervised learning. Alex is a fourth year PhD student in computer science at Stanford, advised by Noah Goodman and part of the Stanford ML and NLP groups. Um, his research has been really quite innovative um, in improving our, our understanding of how to build and control self-supervised models, uh, especially in domain general or multimodal settings. And I am uh, honored uh, and delighted to have Alex with us here today. Uh, so thank you for being here, Alex, and excited for your talk. Thanks, Prime. So great to be here. Um, share my screen. All right, can you see this? Perfect. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm really excited to be here to talk about some of our recent work on um, improving the sort of domain agnosticity and generality of self-supervised learning methods. Uh, I think it's super cool and exciting to be able to talk to a bunch of you because you have so much expertise at the real intersection of medicine and AI. And um, yeah, really uh, excited to, to chat about this and hear your thoughts. So this is work um, with um, a bunch of awesome collaborators at um, Stanford, Vincent Rongfei, Daniel Cullen, and my advisor Noah. Um, and we presented this work at the NeurIPS uh, 2021 Datasets and Benchmarks track uh, recently. And it's about a benchmark um, for domain agnostic self-supervised learning. And it's also sort of like a, a statement for like why we might care about um, you know, self-supervised learning, doing it in a more uh, general and domain agnostic way. So when you sort of look back at the last couple of years, you really see this uh, impressive and tremendous rise of self-supervised learning uh, in, in machine learning across a wide range of different fields. And self-supervised learning has these um, really uh, interesting benefits that have really been separate goals in machine learning for a long while. And I think it goes uh, not perfectly, but a long way at addressing some of them. So for example, some of these self-supervised learning methods like GPT-3, CLIP, and a bunch of others display these really impressive few-shot learning capabilities. So whereas previously you might have needed you know, lots and lots of examples to attain a certain performance on a benchmark or metric, you can now do that with a lot fewer examples with these self-supervised methods. They also have improved robustness. So they've been trained on a really often wide ranging and diverse um, sets of, of data sets. Uh, and often that means that when you transfer them to particular domains, um, they sometimes display improved robustness um, on out of domain examples or to different sorts of corruptions or things like that. They also display these really um, uh, interesting and um, sometimes provocative emergent behaviors. So you'll be improving and increasing the scale of these self-supervised models. And then all of a sudden uh, they'll go from being terrible at a particular task to really, really good at a particular task or not displaying biases and then displaying really strong biases. And um, I think that sort of uh, uh, rise has really been something that people um, uh, uh, has been accompanied with like an increased like need to measure these models and understand them, um, especially before they can be deployed. Um, another really interesting and, and, and impactful factor of these self-supervised models is that oftentimes in fields you had many different models for different tasks. So for in an NLP, you might have had a model for natural language inference and you have a separate model for question answering. And now often these are sort of converged upon in a single model that you can use for a wide range of different tasks. And finally, you can get a bunch of these different phenomena um, without the need to have a large labeled pre-training data set. Um, and so this enables people to scale to much larger uh, data sets and not um, have to deal with the um, cost of human labeling for those data sets. So um, despite all of these um, sort of uh, trends and progressions um, in, in machine learning, there are some potential pitfalls that really lie ahead for the development of self-supervised learning. Um, and there's more than we can fit in this talk, but I'll just sort of focus on two at the moment. And one is that um, you know, many of these developments in different fields, in NLP, in vision, in speech, they're proceeding along somewhat um, parallel tracks. So you might have the same sort of machine learning architectures 
um, like transformers being used across a bunch of different fields. But the particular self-supervised learning algorithms are sort of being developed independently. So you have an advance maybe in NLP, you have an advance maybe in vision, and then separate advances and techniques used to actually train these models in a self-supervised way in each of these different fields. And what that means is that, you know, if you have an insight in computer vision, you develop a better self-supervised learning technique for computer vision, you might improve the model along that particular track, um, but then those insights don't necessarily really transfer to these other domains we care about. And so um, one of the potential benefits, you know, you might wonder, like, if, if there is some sort of technique that works um, and is portable across all of these different domains, um, then maybe they could all advance together. If you have an improvement or an advance in one of these domains, then maybe it might transfer much more broadly. And so those course, that's course scientific question of, you know, what is it actually that drives the success of self-supervised learning methods, um, uh, I think is somewhat missing uh, when we often focus on individual domains. And so as a, a recent case study, you know, there's this really um, exciting and cool work um, called Dino, which is a self-supervised learning technique for computer vision. Um, and, you know, I think there's a, a, an interesting question, which is how generalizable are these techniques that are being proposed that lead to these advances? Um, does it work on just ImageNet, just object classification, just images, or is it sort of more general for all sort of 2D data? And these questions are um, hard to answer right now. And I think we'd really love those answers because it can help us apply self-supervised learning in a much more systematic uh, way across a bunch of these different settings. And so I really, uh, you know, what might be happening is we might be missing the forest for the trees in this focus on individual uh, domains. And we'd really love to answer these broad questions about self-supervised learning, um, these broad scientific questions uh, in a much more general and higher level way, right? Like what are the tensions between discrete approaches to self-supervised learning and continuous approaches? How do uh, the optimal sort of strategies, learning strategies differ on discrete versus continuous domains? Or what are the trade-offs between generative approaches, something like GPT-3, and discriminative approaches like contrastive learning? Um, these are really sort of questions that span a bunch of different domains, which differ in a whole bunch of different ways, um, but that are a bit challenging to answer right now. So that's pitfall number one, which is sort of this more scientific um, question of the relationship between our insights in these different domains. Um, the second uh, sort of pitfall is um, maybe a bit more of a um, sort of thinking about the impact of self-supervised learning and its generalizability. And so, so much of the focus of self-supervised learning is on images, text, speech, which are incredibly impactful domains, you know, and they've been wide, sort of longstanding focuses for machine learning. But there's a whole range of different domains where we might want to apply self-supervised learning, where you know it's arguably extremely impactful. There's lots of unlabeled data, um, but where we are in some ways bottlenecked by actually knowing what the appropriate and generalizable method is um, for applying self-supervised learning. Um, so, for example, genomics and genomic data, um, clean energy, manufacturing, uh, astrophysics. There's this really long tail of domains, um, and uh, so many of them are extremely impactful, impact many, many different people, um, but the amount of ML research in each of these domains is really skewed. And so you have a situation where most of the data um, is in this sort of long tail of domains, um, but most of the effort, especially most of the machine learning effort, which is necessary to produce these good self-supervised learning methods is concentrated at the head of this distribution, you know, in natural images, speech recordings. Again, super impactful areas, but if the techniques that are being developed there don't generalize this much broader range of domains that we might want to apply self-supervised learning to um, uh, and do so in a sort of more systematic way, um, that's a challenge and that's a potential real you know, pitfall for the field. And so arguably what we might want is a sort of off the shelf self-supervised learning method where, you know, just like you can go to, you know, and download a pre-trained model and apply it to different image tasks um, in a pretty sort of formulaic and, and, and um, predictable way, uh, we might like for, you know, given a large unlabeled data set in any sort of 
domain or modality to just be able to take the best general or universal self-supervised learning method and apply it to that data, um, regardless of not, or rather it's in a field like, you know, um, uh, of, of natural images or, um, for example, different types of medical data or scans, different types of industrial processes, or things like that. And so that's where um, this work on DABs came in, um, which is trying to drive progress towards this goal by coming up with a, a benchmark for systematically measuring um, the performance of self-supervised methods um, across these different fields. Where rather than looking at different self-supervised algorithms and how they perform, um, we wanna see if we can come up with some sort of off the shelf uh, generalizable solution that can work across a wide range of different types of data. Um, and so this is a sort of schematic of um, the, all the different components in the DABS benchmark, and we'll walk through them one at a time. Um, but the main goal is, you know, we have a bunch of unlabeled data sets, and we want to have this sort of self-supervised procedure, which is pre-training, um, a model architecture that's general, and a transfer procedure that's held constant across these different domains, where you could use the same one for natural images to transfer to a bunch of natural image tasks, you could do it for pre-trained on sensor data, then transfer to a bunch of sensor tasks, or do the same thing for uh, medical imaging data. And before we even get into this, you know, I think a, a big uh, question that people often ask me is, you know, is domain agnostic self-supervised learning even possible, right? Maybe it really is that you need specialized components uh, and specialized assumptions for each of these different domains. That maybe in order to learn in an unsupervised way, you need to incorporate so much domain knowledge that there really isn't some sort of um, general procedure for learning across different modalities. And I think there's a couple of reasons, uh, really strong reasons to believe that it really is possible. Um, so on the sort of more conceptual side, um, often for any sort of domain um, or, or kind of data, there's these latent factors in the generative process that produce that data. Um, so let's say we're looking at uh, a wearable sensors you know, data set. And, um, you know, at the very beginning, someone's saying, all right, now you should ski, you know? Um, and that's a sort of high level um, task that this person's gonna try to perform. Then the person actually executes that task, you know, using uh, their body uh, on some sort of ski slope. Um, they're wearing some sort of wearable sensor, which has a set of recordings uh, of, 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 uh, and sensors and mechanistic parts, which actually produce the recording from that embodied movement. And then that gets actually like visualized in some sort of input to a neural network. And so the data is not random. It has these sort of very natural, you know, uh, latent factors, which um, end up producing um, this input. And those latent factors are the kinds of things that actually we might care about for a bunch of the different downstream tasks that we might have. So we might actually wanna know or be able to predict um, what the actual task is that's being performed from this recording. We might want to also be able to know like what that device was, right? Each of these things introduce these sort of um, you know coherent latent factors, um, which we might hope and be able to recover in a generalizable way. And we might be able to do that, um, you know, using some basic principles like compression, right? If you have this sort of really high dimensional data, but there's these latent factors that are underlying uh, the generative process for that data, maybe we can compress that data somehow and retrieve those latent processes because that's actually the most efficient way to represent that data. We could also do this potentially with contrasts, right? Um, which is what are, you know, the, the factors that differentiate different data points from each other, um, which is sort of really similar, um, actually, when you think about it a little bit more deeply in spirit to compression. Um, but when you look at the comparisons between points, maybe what actually varies uh, in the most sort of most fundamental sense are these different latent factors. Um, and on the other side, the more empirical side, we've actually seen some recent empirical successes in uh, domain agnostic self-supervised learning. So there's these sort of general um, heuristically defined methods, which are able to be applied in the exact same way to a bunch of different data sets, um, and actually have, have, have had some quite strong success. Um, and then you also have approaches that are more data-driven, where um, you know, a separate maybe neural network generates a different self-supervised problem that's tailored to each particular data set. Um, and both of these over, over the last um, you know, two years um, have seen some recent empirical success, which I think is really encouraging um, 
that we might be able to see a, a general approach that is able to be applied in a really broad way. So I'll start by talking uh, back to the DABS benchmark about the data that we actually use. And this is both the unlabeled data that's used for pre-training as well as the downstream tasks which are used for transfer. And so we look at um, seven different uh, large um, uh, data sets for pre-training, each of which encompasses a sort of different type of modality. So that's anywhere ranging from natural images, speech recordings, images with descriptions, English text, multilingual text, chest x-rays, and sensor data. And each of these are visualized here. And so these are seven unlabeled data sets, which really span a wide range of different domains. Some of them are, you know, like natural images are domains where there's been lots and lots of effort for self-supervised pre-training. And some of them, like sensor data, are ones where there has really been very little um, uh, effort comparatively for self-supervised pre-training. Then for each of these domains, we have a three, you know, we have a, a, a large number of transfer tasks, totaling 35 uh, tasks in total. And so we can see for natural images, once you pre-train, how well do you do on a number of different downstream tasks? And I think really importantly, um, we have more of these uh, domains, both the pre-training and the uh, downstream data sets coming soon, because we really want to capture a much broader, um, you know, a really broad range of possible types of data that people might encounter in practice. And we also want to test, you know, this is a living benchmark. So we want to see if people come up with good solutions for the seven domains that we care about now, um, do they generalize to other domains? Um, because that's actually how people might use this, uh, the, the data sets and the um, algorithms developed for DABs, is they might have a new data set that they haven't seen before. So we want to make sure that they aren't overfitting their algorithms, you know, to the data sets that we are just presenting the benchmark. And so I think these, these data sets and, and the sort of setup uh, really is intended or designed to address these twin goals of DABs. One is, you know, the scientific insights bit, which is like, what is it that makes self-supervised learning tick? Um, what is it that actually leads to the ability to learn without human labels, but to learn from these different patterns within the data themselves? And are there patterns uh, across domains? Do some, you know, algorithms tend to work better for these data sets, whereas others tend to work better for others? You know, these are the starts, the, the kinds of empirical questions that we can start to ask when we have uh, a larger benchmark like this. We can say, you know, is, is this component really necessary or is it only helpful in these types of domains? Um, so that's on the scientific impact side. Um, but then, you know, for the actual like uh, impact, we might actually be able to build a general self-supervised learning algorithm. You know, uh, we might be able to say, you know, are the existing methods actually useful in real world contexts and measure that across some sort of new data sets that we are coming up with right now. So those are the data sets. Now I'll talk a little bit about the model architecture. So model architectures are really interesting because um, uh, there's been a sort of um, recent um, surge of interest in sort of more domain agnostic architectures. Now, when we came up with this paper, there weren't really um, too many uh, strong baselines, both on the architecture side and especially on the algorithm side. So uh, we proposed two, and these are sort of a transformer-based paradigm for these universal self-supervised learning methods. And the idea is you just take your input and you use a small set of embedding modules to turn them into a sequence of embeddings, right? So you have, you know, you might have text and you can turn those into tokens and get those, get from those token embeddings like you do for BERT. Or for vision transformer, you turn the inputs into a bunch of patches and those patches get turned into embeddings. So all you need really is uh, a method for turning these inputs into a sequence of embeddings. And then you can operate the transformer on them uh, sort of equally. Um, and now what you actually do with the transformer during the self-supervised phase is a question for the pre-training objective. So you can have a method that can ingest any kind of data. Now you actually need to do something to learn from it. And so we look at two um, sort of new self-supervised learning methods that are uh, domain agnostic, um, which are sort of spiritual generalizations of things that actually exist right now. So we have eMix, which is a contrastive learning uh, based method. And this sort of is like the, the you know, spiritual uh, successor of like, you know, it represents approaches that have been tried for continuous data. And what it does is it generates these um, data augmentations for um, contrastive learning using mix up 
Um, so it takes the embeddings and it mixes them. Um, and uh, this is sort of very, like, very closely related to this iMix method, which makes the actual inputs. And then what, the, what this equation is basically saying is you have some sort of mixed data and we're going to embed that. And we're also going to embed the clean data. And we want basically the similarity between the mixed data and the clean data um, to be roughly in proportion to that mixing coefficient um, that was used to produce the mixed data. So if I mix an image of a cat and a dog, then that embedding should be somewhere, you know, roughly in between the embedding of the cat and the embedding of the dog. Um, that's the emix algorithm. And on the other side of the spectrum, we also introduce this shed, a uh, shuffled embeddings detection algorithm. And this is kind of, you know, representing the, uh, the text or discrete domain approach. Um, it's sort of a, a, a successor to this Electra method where you have an input text piece and you replace some of the words. You got to predict which ones were replaced and which ones are original. And so we do that, but as opposed to, you know, uh, we don't have a generator, so you just we just shuffle a small section of these embeddings, and you have to predict which ones were the original embeddings and which ones were the fake embeddings. So now that we have those are the two pre-training methods, and what we did was for each unlabeled data set, we did a, we trained a bit different pre-training method on that unlabeled data set, um, and then you need to sort of assess how well can you transfer whatever you learned during pre-training to the transfer tasks. And here there's also a wide range of different approaches that people could use. So on the sort of a very efficient in terms of trained parameters end, um, but lower on the accuracy side, you have linear classifiers, which are very commonly used for contrastive learning um, and in a range of different transfer data sets and approaches. On the other side of the spectrum, you could fine tune your entire model um, and you might get higher accuracy um, at the cost of having to keep track of a lot larger number of trained parameters. And then there's these sort of approaches that try to get somewhere in the middle of these two, um, you know, light, light tuning or lightweight fine tuning approaches, um, like p tuning or prefix tuning or prompt tuning, um, that try to get somewhere in the uh, in the middle of these two worlds. Um, we focus on linear classifier performance for these DAPS baselines, but I think uh, focusing on better transfer methods are really interesting, and it might be that some work better for some domains than others. And so I think that's something we really encouraged in the paper is not just to focus on the pre-training side, but also to focus on the transfer side. And so, uh, like I was saying, we evaluate our different methods using linear evaluation. Um, and we find that we see clear gains um, for, um, you know, from pre-training um, on relatively, you know, modest compute budgets. And obviously a lot of these are predictable. Um, you know, you could try to look at scaling trends to see um, how they'll improve as you train for longer on larger, um, with larger models. Um, and we also see some, um, you know, but we, we clearly see gains from pre-training, um, but they're relatively, you know, modest. Um, it's not like we're sort of matching the performance of, you know, very domain specific methods uh, yet. And so there's lots of headroom. And I think that's where it's really exciting is to think about, you know, what are the future methods that people could use to gain, um, you know, to get much larger gains basically. And to have a, a sort of universal method that might rival um, some of these more domain specific aspects and have the added benefit of transferring to a much wider range of uh, domains. So I think looking ahead, um, you know, there's this question of, can we really avoid uh, these pitfalls ahead for self-supervised learning? You know, um, can we uh, make sure that we really see both the forest um, and the trees, the trees being high performance on individual algorithms, you know, and understanding what makes things tick for, for specific domains, and also coming up with these generalizable insights um, that really enable us to, to see the forest, to really generalize, um, to enable self-supervised learning to be used, um, you know, uh, as a generally useful technology, not just one that's sort of fit to very particular use cases, um, but that's actually ready for, you know, uh, someone to, you know, a domain expert to take their data set and to apply self-supervised learning to it, um, even if they're not in one of these sort of domains in the head of the tail of the distribution. And so some things that I'm excited to talk to you, uh, talk with you about later today, um, especially for, you know, medicine and healthcare are, you know, how well uh, do current self-supervised learning methods generalize? You know, you might imagine different data sets, uh, different hospitals and collection procedures, different body locations, um, different imaging techniques, uh, different modalities. There's also this question of like, you know, uh, domain agnostic doesn't mean that you ignore domain knowledge. Domain knowledge is sort of what's actually, you know, useful for 
um, you know, uh, deciding what actually data sets and tasks you care about. Um, uh, can you do things that layer on to the domain agnostic approaches like medically relevant data augmentation or metadata, like the MedAug paper? Um, what downstream metrics do you actually care about? Um, and then, you know, there's a whole range of other barriers, both algorithmic and logistical, to applying, you know, self-supervised learning to healthcare domains, like access to data and multimodality, privacy and consent, um, you know, different types of data, like time series or tabular data. And so um, I'm, I'm excited to talk, talk with you all later about that, but that is sort of the, um, an overview of our paper um, where we're sort of trying to really uh, encourage more folks to push in this direction and uh, we'll have more data sets soon for people to play with. And we're really excited to see what people come up with. Thanks so much. Great, thanks a lot, Alex. And thanks for sharing your, uh, your thoughts in your, in your talk.